Good evening, hello. Lovely to see you all here. This is very nice turnout. This is very good. Very good. Um, and thank you to Animation Forum for inviting me. It's really fun. I haven't, I haven't actually, well, despite my casual appearance, I haven't actually done this um, hardly at all about the pirates. Uh, I did some talk, when, when the film was released, I did some talks in America uh, on the um, circuit trying to just get some uh, interest so people would go and see the film. And uh, since then, not much actually. No, a quick visit to Sweden. Uh, but I, I, fortunately, I prepared this talk uh, well in advance, and so I'm happy to. So, my plan is to talk to you about the pirates um, in various ways, but in the, about, about production mostly. But as I talk about production, I assume I'll, I'll remember some amusing anecdotes and, um, and, and manage to be. You know, um, uh, naughty about the production process and reveal the secrets and so on. If I can, if I can re remember the secrets. Um, so this film, The Pirates, in the Adventure with Scientists, uh, is derived from this book, and and this book is written by um, a young ish. Uh, grumpy English writer called Gideon Defoe, Gideon Defoe there, good name for a pirate story. And um, where should I start? In America, they didn't call it the Pirates in the Adventure of Scientists. In America, that was its name, right? Uh, and and when we, when it was pitched to the um, marketing people at Sony, they looked kind of pained. You know, they weren't happy. And I think that is a very, very English joke, personally. To me, that is a supremely English joke because it's all about disappointment, really, isn't it? Really. Yeah. It sets you up for something big and spectacular. Ooh, pirates. Everyone loves pirates, you know, that with swashbuckling and colour and cutlasses. And then, it, and then the scientists, who are, <coughs> you know, no kids want to see a film about scientists. That's, that's, a, that's the joke. That's the joke of the book title, the joke of the film. But the Americans weren't happy with that joke. It made them very, very nervous because they thought it might scare kids away. So they went for, much against my better judgment, they went for the pirates' band of misfits. Yeah. It's not. It's nothing, is it? It's nothing. Is it? Yeah. We. I, I tried to sell them on <coughs> on uh, ham and hellfire, which I thought was a very good title, but they wouldn't buy that. <laughs> <laughs> they couldn't say hell, so uh, so the band of misfits they called it. <coughs> and um, but this was a book that that appeared on the, the table on the desk at work one day. We sometimes have meetings about future projects because. You know, in an animation company, ideas are your lifeblood. You know, you, you need ideas. And where on earth are those ideas going to come from? And, and our philosophy has always been to cast the net wide. And the, 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 the easy thing, the casting the net narrow, the closest people are the people who are already at our man, the, you know, the, the directors and the animators maybe and the other creative people there. And the first question is, what ideas have they got? And we take that very seriously. But then beyond that, where else do you get ideas from? So we cast the net wider, and we look at uh, existing films, or old films, classic films, and we look at books, and we look at graphic novels, and comics, and radio programmes, anything, really. Because it doesn't matter where the idea comes from. I couldn't care less where it comes from, as long as it's a great idea. And in that spirit, we looked at lots and lots and lots of books over a long time. Uh, and I sit in these meetings, and there'd be many books on the table, and most of them are, are long, and therefore take quite a lot of reading. And I never had time to read them all, so we'd have someone to read it for you and then give you a synopsis. And it's a bit of a, it's a slightly chilly process, really. It's, it's very hard from that, as, a, as for me standing up there, sitting, sitting at the table to know what's really interesting and really exciting. But on this occasion, I was in such a meeting, and there were a few books on the table, and some comics, I expect, and stuff like that, and um, this was near at hand. And um, uh, it's completely small. 
it's, it's, it's only like 120 pages or something, small format, therefore easy to look at. And I picked it up idly and flicked through it. And, then, and I just thought it was so funny. It just made me laugh, like, repeatedly, continually, just in five or six pages. And I thought, wow, that's, that's really special. And wouldn't it be great somehow to get that on screen? And that was, and that was now... Can't count at least six years ago. Six years ago, at least, when I first picked it up, um, and from picking it up to finally sitting in a sound studio and saying, um, "Oh, shall we fade the music down a little bit for that line?" Yeah, that's better. Is that it then? Yeah, I guess that's it. I guess that's the last creative decision that you make on the film. So between picking up and the last tiny, tiny creative decision it was about five years. So that's kind, of, which is horrifyingly normal in animation, but obviously not in real life. But it's normal in animation, and um, so that was my that was that was that was my adventure. And now I'll, and now I'll tell you about it. My mind just jumps to all the making of in, inevitably. You know, all the, I, I mentally deconstruct it into all the different phases, like from the. Uh, from the writing, you know, like, because Gideon, who wrote the book, wrote the screenplay. This is most unusual. And he wasn't actually experienced as a screenplay, screenplay writer, but just instinctively hugely talented. So he wrote the screenplay. And things like Sweet Neptune's Briny Pants, you know, that was there from the start. To me, pure gold dust, you know. And, um, and I remember the animator, that most of that was animated by a guy called Chris Sadler, incredibly talented <coughs> animator. Um, stubborn, awkward man, and uh, uh, and he insisted on animating everything himself. Uh, he just wanted to, you know. <coughs> Those of you that know stop motion will know that you know, we're control freaks that they are. And um, it was possible that that he could have done the foreground animation of the captain and the crew, and somebody else could have done the background animation. Uh, and in fact, as far as I was concerned, that. You could cycle the background animation because no one was really looking at it. But no, Chris had to do the, every shot, the whole thing himself, even though it involved walking, you know, seven or eight miles during the shot from the from the front of the set where he's doing the foreground characters, round to the back of the set to do the background characters. But he would not be dissuaded from it because typical bloody animator. But um, but you know, really, really, he did it beautifully. He did it beautifully. Um, I remember that. I remember <clears throat> when I see the whale's tongue coming out. I just remember those ridiculous conversations you have where you're standing in the art department with a gigantic piece of foam rubber and say, oh, how big are, how big are the, the nodules on the tongue? And are, they, are they bigger in the middle to get smaller around the side? And, you know, and, and all this kind of thing. And, and how, is the tongue, how is the tongue rigged so that a man can walk on it? And it would give as he walked. And then, um, and then the gold coins that come spewing forth, you know, um, uh, totally CG. And how excited I was when I saw that, how great that was when that was shot. And, uh, uh, and, and arguing with the editor, I wish that sequence had been longer. I, I had, you know, at least, at least two more cuts for that whale flying through the air. And the editor kept persuading me to make it shorter and shorter. I wish it was longer and longer. That's too late now. So I, 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 I see all that stuff when I see the film. I'm going to talk to you really about, about the making of, about the, the, the way you go about making an animated movie, or we do anyway, um, which I hope will be interesting and educational. So I've mentioned the book. I've mentioned the script very quickly. Now that's, in mentioning the script, I shall instantly skip over at least 18 months of of um, very hard work there because every animation script I've worked on has taken a long time to get right a long long time and I can't even explain why just believe me it always seems to take a long time the book didn't really have the story in it that, if that doesn't sound too too ridiculous it had um, no it didn't we, we changed the story a lot from the book um, I think I, I know that we were, you know, my plan was to make um, a very English film, absolutely, that was, 
that was on page one, but also a, a commercial film. That was also very important to me because there was a lot of money involved, so it had to be commercially successful. And so I was mindful to make it um, eccentric in detail, very, I hoped, but also, I won't say conventional, conventional is a terrible word, um, classical in shape, you know, the, there's a way the movies work, the shape, the shape of them, the, way, the, the sort of things that, uh, that, a, that a, a movie story conventionally does, um, you know, the, 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 the first act climax and then the turning point in the middle of the film and then the, the, the dark night of the soul at the end of the second act. This is, I'm, I'm sorry to speak in terms of um, uh, conventions because I don't approve of it, but it works it works um, and, and never follow it slavishly because that's a terrible terrible idea but be mindful of it you, you look at a Pixar film you know they follow it that, that formula very very faithfully and it, and it makes a pleasing shape I can only say that a, a shape which is pleasing to the viewer it seems to deliver emotionally to the viewer so um, without being cynical ever we did try to make a story that was that pleasing shape satisfying shape uh, as well as keeping in all the absurdity and the surprise and the awkwardness of Gideon's style of writing. But that whole process from bright idea and book took about a year and a half, so a long, long time. And then, when you finally got the script, and you think, oh, now we're, now we're ready to start, and it, that may have taken a year and a half and maybe sort of six people working on it, uh, and doing some design in the background. When you finally got that script, you start you start making the film in time, and we make a story reel. Now, some people call it an animatic, and used to call it a Leica reel. I don't know, but it's it's in theory, it's the whole film playing out at full length with music and with voices and with pictures, but none of them are final. It's a it's a rough sketch of the film. So instead of the Final music, you, you use temporary music, which you steal from other people's films, that's fine. And instead of the final actors, you use temporary actors. And instead of finished animation, you use basically storyboard drawings, so the story reel. And um, why do we do that? I know why. I now know why we do that. We do it because in animation, as you will have discovered or will discover, the things that you can't do in animation it's very hard to edit creatively and it's very hard to rehearse because rehearsing involves animation and that takes a lifetime and, and editing tends to involve throwing stuff away you shot so these are, these are terrible terrible things so because you don't want to throw anything away and because you but you don't know how a scene is going to play you to my taste you both rehearse and edit in the story reel stage so I'll show you um, a little fragment of the story reel from the film here we go lads look and learn yeah Somewhere along the line, that was my voice at the end and Hugh Grant's voice at the start. So I'm, I'm not saying that's completely innocent, but something like that is the first stage of the film. So you do that, um, and in theory, you can show the whole film running to 80 minutes in that form, and then you can judge it. You can judge it. Did I get bored in the middle? You know, did I understand everyone's motives? Was it as funny as it can be? You know, was it rambling? Did I get lost? Or, or the million, million decisions that you make, you try to make in that form, because that form is, is relatively cheap and easy. And, and the story artists drew, I mean, a hundred thousand drawings, a prodigious number of drawings. And, and there are many, 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 many scenes that were completely drawn and completely acted out and then completely thrown away. Many scenes. I mean... Uh, if the film is 80 minutes long, I'm sure three times as much stuff was tried and thrown away. There used to be a very, a very hilarious um, showdown in Big Ben. That went, you know. Um, uh, uh, there used to be a, a whole different opening, whereby which started with the captain attacking the Royal Navy and um, destroying the whole Royal Navy single-handed and being rescued by a bunch of dolphins. Um, and we did that, and we drew that, and then we threw it away because it wasn't quite right. So that's the, that's the time when you can play and experiment and um, rehearse 
and edit. Uh, and then, what's next? I wonder? I'm just missing one bit of paper. I think maybe, I think maybe my next thing is going to be recording the actor. The last! I am the pirate captain, and I'm here for your gold. Mr. Hugh Grant. So, um, so we've, we've done it up to this date. We've done it with uh, fake voices, and now we get the, the real actor to do that. <coughs> In a sane world, if one were available, you would record the actors together, but very often that didn't happen. Very often they recorded separate like that. In, frankly, a, a manky cellar in Soho. A crappy old cellar in Soho. Um, I think, we, I think the, my producer got a good deal. Uh, and so, um, and so all, not all the shoot was done in this crappy cellar, which is very down market, I must say, um, uh, except for when we recorded Salma Hayek, which we got to do in a very fancy studio in Paris, which only made me more pissed off about the, the, uh, uh, the manky cellar. But um, that was Hugh Grant, uh, and that was, that was probably quite late in the 2010. That was, well, that was later. That was actually the, in fact, I bet you he was doing that for the, I bet he was, do, he was doing that for the making of uh, behind the scenes stuff. Um, but anyway, he, he records his lines, and then, and then we can, then we can animate his lines. Then I think the next thing which is about to appear is the lip sync. Let's see if it is. Here we go, lads. Look and learn. Yeah! Ha! Go get him, pirate captain. Boss! I'm the pirate captain, and I'm here for your gold. See what we got there. Is not lip sync at all. That, that, the previous, previous. It's almost embarrassing to reveal that in a sense we made the film three times. That is quite embarrassing to reveal. Once as drawings, once as crappy computer animation, and the third time as, as proper animation. I mean, it's a crap, I don't mean computer animation <laughs> is per se crappy. That was crappy because, because it's very, very rough. It's, but, and that was previous. Oh, God. Oh, God. And previous. Is, is, is an enormous, expensive and complicated process, which, as you can see, involved making models of all the puppets and all the sets, you know. And it was designed, for us, it was designed to make the shoot easier so that we knew accurately, when we got to the studio floor, how big a set we needed and what camera moves we needed. That was the theory. Well, that was, that was why we did it. Um, uh, in practice, you could have done previews for half the shots in the film, those that had camera moves in particularly and so on. But, but once you've done the first half, you think, oh, well, we may as well shoot the rest as well. So, so th there is probably a version of the whole film in that form. But no one will ever see this version because it was, it's too terrible to behold. Um, it, has, it has no performance in it. OK, so that's, that's, that's previews to work out where the camera's going to go and who's in shot and the camera move. Then the next phase is the lip sync. I'll come back to this. I'll come back to lip sync, but we needed to plan the lip sync. Aha! I'm the pirate captain, and I'm here for your gold. We'll come back to that later because it's um, very complicated, but uh, that's, um, that touches on rapid prototyping. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and, uh, but, but we do that, and so, so we know what mouth shapes we need for the shots. Okay? So we plan, a, we plan ahead what his mouth needs to be doing for all different shots. And then, finally, we get around to shooting something. Now we're, getting, now, we're getting, now we're getting there. Now we're on the studio floor. Now we've got puppets. We know what the lip sync's doing. We know what the camera's doing. Here we go, lads. Look and learn. Yeah! Ah! Go again, pirate captain! Ah! I'm the pirate captain. And I'm here for your goal. So that scene... Obviously, all green screen. Visit, we can all see it's all green screen. Uh, particularly, particularly obvious because it involves the ocean. Uh, and um, you know, some of you may have attempted stop frame animate the ocean. It's a mugs game. You know, we've tried it. We've tried it. You know, with industrial quantities of KY jelly and uh, cling film. But it's, it's not a good idea. It's just ridiculous. So you know, we thought about it, but but no, the ocean was going to be was CG. And uh, there's a lot of compositing, ob obviously. So we, sh we shoot the foreground action, we shoot the background action separately, um, and then the ocean and the skies were put in, in CG afterwards. It, on a film like The Curse of the Were-Rabbit, the Walter Gromit film, most of the skies, not all, but most of them were 
were painted on canvas in a highly traditional way. Um, I like that. I like that very much. But this film was so ambitious and the studio wasn't getting any bigger. The studio was the same size. And this film was very ambitious. And really, we would have needed vast, vast canvas, bigger than, bigger than we had. So it was, it was kind of an economy move. It was, it was a practical necessity to shoot it green screen. So a lot of the film is shot green screen. And now, the, uh, and now the final sequence. Here we go, lads. Look and learn. Yeah! Ah! Go and get him, pirate captain. Blast! I'm the pirate captain. And I'm here for your goal. So that, and, and that, so there, there we see in that, that quick run through, we see sort of, you know, three years work, I suppose, from start to finish from... I don't mean just on that one shot, but across the whole film, from, from the storyboard phase to the finished film. And, um, you know, and because of the green screen, because of the puppet animation and so on, it, some of the, the big shots, the swing, the swing across the, the sea shot with the sea in the background and the ship in the background, you know, probably that shot would have been in production for four months or something. So a long time from starting it to finishing it. But um, I enjoyed that. That was, that was that was fun. Thank you for downloading this podcast from Birmingham City University. For more information, please go to itunes.bcu.ac.uk.